Hello and welcome to Explain Apologetics. Uh, today we are very honored to have uh, a very uh, special person in our organization. We have uh, Pastor Mark Tan, who is our co-founder uh, along with Pastor Samuel Nason. And today we are going to talk on a very uh, familiar yet important topic. We are going to talk on the topic of prayer. But before that, uh, hi Pastor Mark and welcome to another video. Hi Marcus, thank you so much for having me. It's great uh, to be here. No. Yeah, it's wonderful working with Mark and uh, I'm sure today we'll, this video will be uh, uh, a blessing to many, uh, especially when uh, for many of us who grew up uh, probably in Christian families uh, who are very familiar with the uh, idea of prayer, but not just for those uh, who grew up as a Christian, but I believe also many uh, who came to know Christ uh, some uh, part in their some time in their life? Uh, this uh, topic of prayer would also be an issue, particularly when we consider some of the things uh, that are mentioned in the Bible. And uh, we know that sometimes uh, the Bible, not sometimes, the Bible has many things to say about prayer. And sometimes, if we do not uh, study it carefully, it can uh, be a, an issue to our understanding. Uh, and one of the reasons why we want to uh, talk about prayer today was because um, a few months ago, uh, we encountered, came up across a Facebook post, uh, which was uh, made by a quite a decently well-known person in Malaysia. And the post was uh, sort of mocking believers and the, the very idea of prayer uh, and it was mentioning that um, prayer does not heal, prayer does not eradicate any diseases. Uh, we'll show you a snapshot of the post uh, in this video. should be posted up very soon. Um, and the comments that surrounded it were, were just a mixed bag, you know, from uh, uh, arguments from the peers and the arguments from the atheists. And uh, even some of us, uh, myself included, um, participate and join in some of the comments and the conversations and it was a very interesting uh, kind of dialogue where you see how people uh, argue for their positions and, and sometimes it does get a bit heated uh, you know especially when there's a lot of mockery uh, on social webs uh, social uh, postings uh, and really it, it is a topic that uh, we believe that we need to address uh, you know, considering the, the many comments uh, that we see there were comments that were uh, uninformed, the comments that uh, did not have a proper understanding uh, of what prayer is. And so uh, maybe let's just start with the, the basic, the most basic question of all. Uh, Ma, what, what is prayer and why is it important to us as Christians? A good question. A good question, Marcus. Um, when I think about prayer, I'm thinking about not just uh, Christian prayer. I'm thinking about how prayer is actually not just one particular religious experience. It is a, it is a religious experience that actually translates through many religions, somehow or another. Um, whether you are religious or even when you're irreligious, there is a notion of a higher power. And not only is there a notion of higher power, but there is also the, the somewhat the faith, the, the understanding of faith in that we assume that because there's a higher power, somehow or another, we can communicate with him, it or her. So other religions uh, tend to go on the idea worse, uh, and that is, there is a, if there is a supreme being, if there is a higher being, there is therefore a notion or means to communicate with them. And so, when they, and so when they communicate with them, they try to express their desires, their wishes, you know, and if they have crossed the deity or some sort or another, they will seek forgiveness and hopefully they think that whatever offering or sacrifice they give is sufficient. Now let's look at the Christian faith. The interesting thing about the Christian faith is that prayer 
is a, is a, is a two-way communication. Let me repeat that again. Prayer is a two-way communication between God and humanity. And unlike uh, any other faiths or any other religions, there is no assumption. The fact of the matter is that before we could even communicate with God, the Bible actually displays to us that God had communicated with us first. Genesis chapter 1, uh, when they talk about the creation of mankind. And God, and so God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created man. Male and female, he created them. And then he spoke to mankind and he says, Be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the earth. Notice then, the first means of communication was not creation to the creator, but, to the, but the creator to creation. So that assures us a promise that God speaks and he speaks to us through his spirit, and somehow or another, we can communicate with him. Now for the gospel input. There was a, while other faiths, and while other faiths tend to have an uncertainty as to, you know, does God even hear my prayers at all? We as Christians actually say, yes, God hears everything and everyone because God has this, mean, has this uh, compassionate desire to communicate with his creation. Uh, but he also has an agenda, and his agenda is holiness, his agenda is um, to display his wonders on this earth. But because of sin, we try to manipulate prayer, and we try, and by that we try to manipulate, manipulate God, and God, and trying to ask God, and try to twist God's arm to get us what we want. And so the communication breaks down. Mm -hmm. But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, He shows us that there is a means to return back to him through his sacrifice, through his salvation, through believing that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, then that changes the communication dynamics in two ways. One is that our souls are no longer condemned because of our unrighteousness. We are then made anew. That is the notion of Jesus Christ as Savior. But now for the notion that Jesus Christ is Lord, Jesus Christ is Lord, is a submission. So when we submit ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, it also means that our lives are to be guided by Him as Lord, and therefore our prayers as well. And so our prayers, can we still pray what we, for what we want? Yes. But if we still submit to the idea that He is Lord, that means we also give Him the authority to give us what He thinks would best suit us and His glory. So that's prayer in general and prayer in the Christian faith. Okay. Thanks, uh, Ma. That was an interesting uh, uh, answer. Uh, I, I want to uh, just focus on one point that you, you mentioned, that um, prayer in the Christian context is a, a two-way communication. And you brought up a, a very interesting thing when you refer back to Genesis when God first communicated to man. Uh, would you say that would be the, the distinct idea between a Christian's prayer uh, compared to prayers of uh, other faiths? Uh, or is that just unique to the Christian faith? Or does any other faith speak of such a communication as well? The Judeo-Christian world, the Judeo -Christian world view would be the ones that, the, uh, that, this, that mentions this first communication is from God to mankind very explicitly. Um, we... So if you go into if you go into Chinese folk beliefs, it's almost as if the story is happening above us, above humankind, and mankind is just merely witnesses. Then later there's a participation. Uh, in Hinduism, the Bhagavad Gita, in the Gita, it talks about the gods doing stuff and humankind, and humankind interacting. So there is a sovereignty. In their, in their concept, in their understanding. But the direct communication between mankind and, uh, mankind and the deities is very vague. So there is, uh, there'll always be a, a little bit of a gap uh, of uncertainty as to whether does God even want to hear us in the first place because it looks like he has his own agenda. So the Judeo-Christian worldview, so Judaism, uh, Christi Christianity, and in, and in some extent, Islam, actually has this uh, particular uh, direction in that, yes, 
God does have an agenda. Does have an agenda, but His agenda directly invo involves humanity. Not merely His angels, not merely His heavenly dwellings. He doesn't have battles in the heavens to to, to deal with. Uh, so His agenda is actually with humankind on this earth, and that makes that uh, that makes our communication and prayer much more meaningful uh, and much more purposed as compared to any other face I've interacted with. Mm, right. Yeah, I agree. I think that the idea that, that God is very clear in his communication uh, to us uh, right in the beginning of Genesis all the way to Abraham, Moses, I think it, it, it's, it's, really, it's really clear how, how God uh, actually speaks to his people. And even until today, I think, uh, you know, it is said that uh, in the former days, he spoke through the prophets, and now in the last day, he has spoken through his son. I think I, I agree entirely. The God of the, the God of the Bible really speaks to us really clearly. Um, so, uh, moving forward, uh, now that we've clarified uh, just uh, a little bit of the understanding of the Christian's prayer, I um, want to get into... Uh, uh, some more, um, may I say, application uh, of prayer. Uh, and I think when we talk about prayer, one of the many things that, uh, at least in our Malaysian culture, we want to know is, um, does prayer work? Uh, and uh, if it does work, how, how does it, uh, what effect does it have in our life? Well, um, does prayer work? It's a very loaded question because when we think when we say prayer, we think com not just communication with God, but our communicating to God, our desires to His, uh, our desires to His ears, to His, to, to to His space, and somehow or another, the only thing that we want and the only thing that we expect is for Him to fulfill what we want. So that's a very loaded question. So two things can be said about prayer. One is from a one is from a empirical perspective. So there's something very interesting that is going on in terms of uh, scientific research, and then on the other perspective is theological. So from the empirical perspective, uh, National Geographic some time ago actually published an article, and talks about how um, what they call the placebo effect of prayer actually is part of the healing process. So what does that mean? They studied uh, twenty. They studied a, a, a set of people. Half of them are religious. The other half are non-religious. Uh, which religion is not disclosed? There's a mixture of them. Some were Christian. The one that was very much uh, folk, the one that was very much uh, uh, described or displayed on is uh, of them is the tribal Hmong group and their and their pagan and their pagan religion, which is uh, animistic. They have a witch doctor. You know, and they go through a, a, a ceremonial healing, uh, a healing ceremony before they go into surgery. And what they have found out is that out of the litmus group of people that were religious and non-religious, there is a higher group, the, there's a higher healing rate, a better healing rate among the religious. I think about 80% of them actually, uh, actually were healed, were going through the healing process much better as compared to the non-religious, those that do not have any prayer in particular, uh, do not say any prayer or, or in particular, they will only about maybe 60%, 50% will actually have a better, uh, will, will have a better healing experience after the surgery after the, uh, and after treatment. So from an empirical perspective, prayer actually does work. It does actually give confidence and hope, not just to your mind, it translates to your body to have that confidence to actually go through the healing process better. Mm -hmm. So that creeps into the theological bit. And, it, and that makes things a lot more interesting. So three questions can actually come up from, well, from that empirical study. Number one is, does prayer work? Well, from a theological pers perspective, we can obviously, see, obviously say yes. But prayer is not a formulation. Prayer is not a formula. It is not something that, you know, if you say the right words, in the right mindset, at the right altar, in the right direction, you get exactly what you want. It's not a mathematical, it's not a mathematical formulation or formation. It is actually a personal interaction with God. So what does that mean? It means that 
when you talk to God, God has every right in His way to respond in any way that He desires. I mean, look at the conversation that we're having right now, Marcus. You and me, you ask me the question, you cannot expect me to, uh, you do not expect me to answer in a particular way. Okay, so maybe we do have an agenda and we both agree on the agenda. And that's why your communication to me is being fulfilled. Your desire is being fulfilled because why? You, we are communicating and we both agree. And only because we both agree, then we're having this, uh, they're having this topic discussion which will come to its full fruition. However, if let's say, for example, you communicate with me and I have a different agenda, I'm going somewhere else, I'm doing something else. You're not going to have this video recording. We're not going to have this discussion. You see? Why? Because it is each of others' uh, right to freedom of expression. And for God, it is his sovereign right to do in accordance to what he desires, in accordance to his will. Mm. So when we pray, He's bound to when he's, when he's praying, he's bound to answer, but his answers is based on his will. So, not meaning to sound cheesy, he will answer either yes, no, or wait. Mm -hmm. Not immediately, maybe not ever, but maybe certainly. So it's really up to him because he's a personal character. And I find that when people pray, people think that we we go up to God and God has no personality. And because God has no personality, he then has no, no desire to have a relationship. Of course he desires to have a relationship because he's a, he's a very personal character. If he was not a personal character, he would have no desire to make anything. It right. takes that personal drive to actually do something. And because he did that, that means there is a relationship to be desired. So that's one thing. The other thing is, given the empirical study, the question would then be, does God then answer pagan prayers? Because we were talking about the empirical group, how half of them, the how half of them that were religious, that are religious, okay, mm -hmm. um, they said their prayers in their own traditions and religions and factors. Then does God Almighty, who revealed Himself in Jesus Christ, then answer all of their prayers? Because eighty percent actually had a better healing rate as compared to the non-religious, which is only fifty percent. And the answer is. Interesting enough, it is also a yes and no. Mm -hmm. It is not just them praying, but it's actually his relationship with humanity. So in accordance to his will, he knows who is going through what sort of circumstance, opposition, obstacles in their lives, and by his and by his sheer grace, by his prevenient grace, as some traditions would say, he dispenses his mercy and his healing upon everyone in ways that he would see fit. So that's why it's not only those who prayed, most of them got healed. Even those that didn't pray, God has a desire to heal them and care for them. Mm -hmm. So the transcendent, so the transcending understanding of who God is in Christianity is very, very profound in that, when we say that God is sovereign, He is sovereign to all creation, even to those who disregard Him or do not believe in Him. When we say that God is healer, we mean that He is the driving force of all sort of every kind of healing. The doctor is useless unless God, uh, unless God gives him that gives him that space and probably and either in probability in creation, or even by divine intervention, then only the patient will actually be truly healed. And so then it comes to then the immediate application. If I am sick, yeah, if I am sick, should I therefore pray, hoping that God will answer? And the answer is, yes, of course. The child may ask how, whatever he wishes of the, of the father. It is therefore up to the father as to whether it is time to give it to you or not give it to you or maybe give it to you later. And most of the time, even for me as a father, when I give something to my daughter, it's not just purely at the time that she desires it, but I will give it to her at the right moment where she will appreciate both the item or the thing or the favor that I'm asking her to do, that she's asking me to do, and also at the best time where our relationship can be strengthened. So God will answer his pray uh, will answer prayers, therefore with the hope that his relationship with humanity 
can actually be strengthened and ultimately strengthened through Jesus, the Savior and Lord. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I think sometimes the idea that uh, uh, I, I, people have this sort of uh, mistaken idea that when you pray, the results must be immediate. And I think that you, you brought a very interesting point uh, uh, when you, you gave the analogy with, with your child, with your daughter, that uh, when she asks for something, sometimes you don't give it to her immediately, but you, you wait for the right time, uh, for the best moment, uh, when the time is, is, is fit to, to give it to her. Uh, but there's another problem as well that uh, I think many uh, Christians would then uh, ask, uh, uh, because uh, we know that in Matthew uh, 21 verse 22, uh, and also in, in many parts of the, the Gospels, uh, where Jesus does promise uh, that if you ask anything in prayer, and if you, you, you ask in his name, uh, you will receive it. So how does that tie in with uh, what you just said, that, that God sometimes should give a yes? A no, or sometimes uh, you you ask us to wait. Yes, um, Matthew twenty one verse twenty two is a very beautiful verse. If you believe, if you believe, you receive whatever you ask for in prayer. That's that's a very nicely worded verse, uh, especially in the NIV. No, I'm, I'm particular to NIV. So yeah, uh, it's it's nice. It's a nice phrasing, and it feels so confident. But unfortunately, the verse by itself is an out of contact verse that may give theolo they may give some they may give some the truthful theological hope, but it is incomplete. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is Matthew chapter twenty one verse twenty two? Matthew chapter twenty one verse twenty two is the concluding statement, and it's not even the full statement. Okay, and verse twenty two is that if you believe you receive whatever you ask for in prayer. But what is the context of that verse? The context of that verse is in a curse. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the story actually goes back five verses. Uh, uh, three, one, two, three, four. Five, yeah, four verses before that. Okay? So in verse 18, it says, Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry, seeing a fig tree by the road. He went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately, the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so, quick, so quickly? And then Jesus' answer is actually from verse 21. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but you can also say to the mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Now, when the disciples was asking to Jesus, okay, the disciples was asking to Jesus, how did he do it? <laughs> okay, and how did he do it? He did it to which he then says, you know, uh, he uh, because uh, he then says that in context to me, in context to me, all you need to do if you want to do exactly how I did it. Is that you just go just go and ask it out by faith and it will happen. Not only will fig trees wither, but you can even move mountains. And so you can and, and so and if you go and if you go throw yourself into the sea and, and you tell the mountain go throw yourself into the sea, it will be done. So therefore, if you believe, so if you have faith, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. But look at the look at the context before that. Jesus was actually Jesus actually put that curse upon the fig tree because he want, he was looking for fruit. He went over there and only saw leaves. You see, and mm -hmm. that, and that actually is a notion of uh, uh, that's actually a no, uh, a notion or a um, an understanding uh, or a parabolic a parabolic understanding that everyone in this world has a purpose and place. We have mm -hmm. things that needs to be done. We have things that an agenda was given to us, and if we and if we complete the will of God, then of course whatever we de whatever we de whatever we desire or whatever we need to fulfill God's agenda will be fulfilled. But if we do not, then what then then for what reason would God uh, answer the prayer if it's in not if it's not in accordance to His will? So in mm -hmm. other words. The verse in verse 21, verse 22, 
it must be understood in context. Jesus is not giving a blank check for those with enough faith, okay? but he is promising that those with faith will see, will see the wonders of God and our participation in it. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. So that's, a, so that's a profound thing. You know. When we think, and I feel, especially among the Christian community, a lack of understanding of the end of the world, eschatology and what happens to us when we die, uh, really, really uh, blindsides us when it comes to our interaction with God. When we interact with God, it is with an agenda of the end of the world and the end of our lives on this earth at hand. And so, when we pray and when we interact with Him, it must be done in the broader context that God is not giving you a blank check, but God has already prepared all the checks and all the things that you need with the exact figures and amounts and, 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 and tasks and things that you need at the right place at the right time. He's just mm. waiting for that right place and right time to be able to accomplish it in confidence, uh, 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 in your confidence, in your faith, and in the timing which we are called to fulfill. Mm-hmm. So essentially, what, what you're saying is that this, this, this text and many of these um, verses in the Gospels have to be understood in, within uh, the idea of God's will and God's plan. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. There's a song out there that's called the Worship Song Song. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can find it on YouTube, right? And my favorite, my favorite line is in the pre-chorus, you know? Uh, life's got me down. I'm running. I'm on the edge of my rope. Here's an out of Bible. Yeah, here, here's an out of context Bible verse about hope. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so anyone can take a Bible verse and generalize it to a point where it looks like you know, oh, you know, we have, uh, we 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 can get confidence because God will give us what we want. But actually, that means is that I'm trying to find a Bible verse which tells me that I can force God to do whatever I want. Mm. But if we right recognize God's sovereignty and maybe sovereignty is also maybe a, a, too, a too heavy of a word, too cold of a word. Perhaps we can think of it as interaction. Just as any humankind meeting together, we both have our own agendas and therefore our own responses. So does God. When we communicate with, each, when we communicate with Him and He communicates with us, we both have the agenda and we would actually see more and more of our prayers fulfilled not in that God is meeting our agenda, but more of we are meeting His. Right. Right. And I think it's, it's so important to read these verses in context because we, we've seen the, the kind of uh, consequences and, and deadly consequences of, of uh, people who have this sort of idea that, you know, whatever I pray and uh, just anything and everything, you know, I pray for uh, God will answer. And, you know, uh, many people... Uh, as we have come across, uh, uh, have actually um, abandoned their faith because of, of these things. Uh, uh, I myself has, have also seen people who, who, who at the loss of a loved one, uh, they think their prayers for healing wouldn't uh, answer and it somehow goes against what the Bible says about prayer. Mm-hmm. And you know, eventually they think the Bible isn't true and, and God isn't real. Um, so I think it's a, it's a wonder, a brilliant point that you brought up that we have to read it in its context. Otherwise, it, it's so, it's, uh, it, it, it brings more harm than it does good to us. Uh, another let's, thing, um, if you don't sorry. mind, let's, let's, uh, let's dwell on what you, uh, uh, let's dwell on the example that you brought up a bit earlier, uh, uh, brought up earlier uh, just now. And that is the idea that, you know, and this is a very typical context in any faith, but especially Christianity, all right? So suppose, so suppose a family has lost a loved one, a father or a mother, a parent usually, uh, due to cancer. They've been, fighting over, they've been fighting over the cancer, praying, asking for God to intervene and say, Dear God, please heal, please heal, please heal. If you heal, then we will praise you, then we will praise you forever. You know, chemotherapy, uh, the, the chemotherapy get, had some effect, but then there was a cancer, then the cancer relapsed, uh, uh, had, a, had a relapse and it went even worse. And before you know it, uh, within six months, you know, the person, the, the, the loved one, the father, let's say the father, for example, passes away. And then here we are at the, and then here we are at the wake service at the funeral. And as we give the message of hope and confidence, you know, the child will still ask the question, you know, they'll come up to, and they, I've had this before, they'll come up to say, Pastor Mark, we prayed, we fasted, we've, uh, 
we we intervene. God know God, God knows God knows that God knows my father. He's been active in church, so he even try and put merits on the father, right? You know, he's been active in church, serving in various ministries, impacting young people. You know, why didn't God heal him? You know, you know, is this God even real? So there are two things that needs to be said about this. Uh, and I remember telling to this young child, and I, and I know this, and, and the reason I can do it because I know this child well enough that she's mature enough to be able to, to take this answer. And that is this. Number one is, God has heard her prayer. I told her, you know, God has heard your prayer. Mm-hmm. It's just that it is not in His will at the moment. It is not in His will to have us worship Him in reflection of healing but is to have us worship him even in our sorrow. And even if and, and even this might be the most sorrowful moment for you, just know this. Notice that any time that we are in our pain or in our grievances, we actually do go up to God and seek for help. And he will. He'll give that peace of God that suffices all understanding will be in your hearts if you continue as a, as as you continue to be faithful to him, even though uh, your father has been taken home. And that's the other thing that can be that can be said, you know. What makes you think that what makes you think that when the father has left this earth, it is the end of his life, right? You see, we pray as if this life is all we have, YOLO, but actually that's not true, you know. When we die, it is like when we die in faith and confidence in Christ Jesus, He will wipe away every tear. There will be normal sorrow. There will be normal pain, right? You know, would that not be what something that we would want that we would want our loved ones to have, especially if he goes through, especially if he went through such a horrible, uh, horrible cancer experience. Yeah. So at the same time, thanks be to God through our love for our parents, and oh, there will always be this balance whereby, you know, I want you to be healed, but I also don't want you to suffer. Mm. And who can and who can therefore be the person that take away all the sorrow and pain? It will be God. Mm-hmm. So that so prayer so prayer then becomes something that helps us realize not just how God uh, how God answers answers prayers and how God does things, but also who God is mm-hmm. and what He has and what He has prepared for us, not just for now but for eternity. Mm. I think this would tie up uh, tie in with uh, like what you mentioned. That sometimes with uh, with our um, lack of understanding of eschatology, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, that if we we if we don't uh, um, grasp enough of the idea of of eternal life and and you know what comes after death, I think this would often be a stumbling block uh, in these kind of situations, right? Mm-hmm. Indeed, I mean we we get this all the time in our in our churches and our young people and. Even non-believers looking into look, look, non-believers looking into our faith, you know. But I would say this uh, for those who get the faith of the, for those who get the faith of which we hold and which we stand to, uh, they begin to actually have a deeper respect. Uh, those who believe and those who have yet to believe, they also have a very deep respect on how we look at death and the end times, especially mm-hmm. because why? When we go to a funeral, you know, it's when we when we have a Christian funeral, for example, it's not noisy, it's not loud, it's not it's not it's not uh it's not overwhelming to 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 our to our senses. In fact, it is and it's not and it's not doing a religious ceremony with hope that maybe maybe he can cross over the bridge and go into heaven, you know. Right. Or if he's or if we all know that he's meant to go to that he's meant to go to hell. You know, let's at least make it as comfortable as you can. So I'm talking about the Chinese folk belief, right? So yeah. you know, and we're not really sure as when we when we when we burn that paper money, you know, will it go to him to be able to bribe the guy so he can go over the bridge? <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's always this uncertainty, and with that uncertainty comes a it comes a sense of very deep and hollow grief. But for the Christian faith, we are not. There's not. There's nothing. There's nothing left uncertain. There's mm-hmm. nothing. Le- there's nothing left to be said. Only that. Uh, only that. When we go. Only when we leave this world, we have only one of two destinations to go to. One is that we either 
go into a Christless eternity or we go into an eternity with Christ. Right. And how do we know? How do you know which, de which destination we go? Very simple. Who are we? It, it, God, God has actually given us the choice. Where do we want to go to? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, absolutely. I think that was brilliant. That was actually really beautiful. And I think uh, that, that's the wonder and, and the beauty of, of the Christian message is that even in death, we have that certainty because, uh, because Christ died for us and he rose again uh, to give us eternal life. I think that is uh, really just the ultimate assurance that any Christian could have. Uh, and exactly. leading, uh, leading into another question, uh, I was just about to, to, to say that, but I think I'll let the question fit, uh, speak for itself. Um, mm -hmm. Does prayer change uh, God's mind? Because, uh, you know, uh, we... Uh, Many people will, will quote Genesis 18 where uh, Abraham meets with the angel of the Lord and supposedly um, the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, and, and it seems like they had an exchange. You know, God, uh, uh, if you find, if I, uh, what if there are 50 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, will you destroy? And God says no. And then Abraham comes back again and says, how about 45? Uh, and, they, and God says, no, I will not. And it goes all the way until uh, five, you know. So, uh, uh, does prayer change God's mind? Do you think that's a, 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 a story or a narrative about Abraham changing God's mind? Or, or if it's not, what, what, how do you read that? Okay, so let's think about Genesis 18 very quickly. Okay? Mm -hmm. Genesis 18 is, is, uh, is the interaction between Abraham and the angel of the Lord, a Christophany, of, uh, a Christophany if you want to put it that way. And because why? Uh, it is the idea that because Sodom is so full of sin, I will, dis I will destroy it all. Okay? And it looks, and so if we look from a, from a human to human context, it would be as if a powerful warrior has decided that I will have my revenge and I will destroy everybody. And I am very, very, and I'm very, very certain. I know that, and my, and my desire is I will kill everybody. Mm -hmm. Then someone comes out and bargains. No, don't don't kill everybody. Kill fifty. What well, if you find fifty people? Then don't then then don't don't destroy the whole city. He's like, okay, I will. Then I won't. You know, I if you can if, if fifty is okay, why not forty? If not forty, why not thirty? Why not thirty? Why not ten? Like, okay, fine. Ten. If I can find ten people, which I doubt I will, you know, I will I will go into the city. And if I can find ten people, then I will not destroy. It, you know. So we sounds. So number one is that it, we assume that God does not know everything. But God knows everything, okay? And therefore, he knows. And so when he's having the conversation with Abraham, he already says that, you know, Abraham, I know you're going to have that conversation. And I promise you this, if really, really there was even 10 people to, 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 to say uh, to, that, that are righteous, I will, not, I, will not destroy, I will not destroy Sodom. But he's confident to give that promise because why? He cannot even find 10 people. <laughs> You see, so there's one, one thing is that we assume that God doesn't know everything like a human being. But God knows everything. So he's more than just mere man. La. He knew that when he goes, when he's having this conversation with Abraham, you know, the end result will still be the same. Mm -hmm. However, does, has God determined everything? The answer is, the, the, the answer is not entirely. Mm -hmm. Okay? And what I mean by not entirely, you see, if God had determined everything, he would even have the conversation with Abraham. He would just go ahead and destroy Sodom. And when Abraham asks, hey, why did you do that? He said, oh, I determined it already. There's nobody there worth saving. I'm destroying the whole place. The conversation would be very different. Mm -hmm. But what God has done is that he has determined a moment where, our, where, where Abraham's prayer and interaction with the angel will have an efficacious effect on the next step of what God is planning to do. Okay, mm -hmm. so let me let, so let me take things a bit more. Let me put things into a bit more primitive perspective. Okay, my daughter comes up to me and says, "Daddy, I want to make pancakes. Can we make pancakes together?" So I'm like, "Okay, okay, uh, okay. We will make, okay. We will make pancakes, right?" And when I say we, it means that she wants to get her hands dirty and she wants to be part of it. All right, so. I give her, and so what we do is that I will put the flour in the bowl, she puts in the eggs. 
I put in the melted butter. She puts in the milk. I stir. I stir the larger. I, I stir the larger. The I stir, I stir with the larger spatula. She stirs with a spoon. You see. Now. Has so now has the outcome been determined already? Yes, we yep. will have pancakes. Is her participation in it uh, efficacious? Not to say meaningful. Is it efficacious? Meaning, is her involvement part of uh, become part of co accomplishing the final goal? Yes. Yeah. I crack the eggs in the bowl so she can take the bowl and pour the eggs into the larger mixing bowl. I have determined that that no one else except my daughter will be the one that do that. What does that mean? It means that if my daughter does not do it, we will not have pancakes. Mm -hmm. So right. it's significant. It's significant at the same time, at the same time meaningful, in that God has called us to involve ourselves in His will, even in prayer. And so right. when we look at Abraham and the conversation. God did not change. God therefore does not change his mind, but God has already preset. The, but God has already, has preset things in such a way that there will be a honest, that there will be honest and truthful interaction between us and Him when we pray. Mm, okay. Um, so following up from that, um, I think one of the uh, less asked question, but still quite an important question, is uh, with regards to the Lord's prayer. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, in Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13, um, we know that Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. And he says, pray then like this. Um, and we, we sort of know the, the Lord's prayer, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. So um, is that, um, must we then pray uh, the, the same way uh, as, as Jesus prayed or uh, would it be okay to pray for, let's say, other issues? Because I think that uh, particularly students, you know, we, we pray, they pray for um, exams, you know, uh, uh, like this mundane stuff. Um, but this isn't really in the Lord's Prayer, you know. So um, uh, do you think that the, the Lord's Prayer is like a step-by-step -step guide to, to how as a Christian we should pray? Or is it sort of like a... Um, a model that we can sort of follow or is it just sort of uh, uh, an example uh, of a kind of prayer? Okay. So I blame the Asians and as well as myself and our tendency to make anything sound nice turn into a magic spell. <laughs> okay. So, um, and it's unfortunate that, uh, especially with those who come from the traditional churches, you will find that the Lord's Prayer will be prayed every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, either it will be in the liturgy where, or in the order of service. We will pray as Jesus prayed, our Father in heaven. Okay, the problem about, and I blame pastors like myself and pastors like my friends who tend to just leave the liturgy alone without any explanation. Okay, and that is, and so let me, and so, and so let me, so let me rephrase things. Immediately speaking, I will tell you this. Word for word, you do not need to pray the Lord's Prayer. Word for word. You do not need to pray. You do not even need to pray the the what they call the formulation of the Lord's Prayer. I Meaning to say that, oh, you know, uh, if you don't eat bread, you know, so at least you know you say, give us today our daily food. And that's all we can ever ask for. No, that's not true. But Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 13. It's not the full context of the passage. The passage actually talks, actually starts on verse five, on prayer, and at the end, it actually ends in verse fifteen on the on the notion of forgiveness of sins. So the Lord's prayer is not a, it's not even a, it's not even meant to be a formula. The Lord's prayer is actually in context of, of what Jesus is talking about. Prayer is actually talking about the attitude of prayer. And how do we know that? We see in verse 5, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. He's talking about attitude. They love mm -hmm. to pray standing in the synagogues and the street corners. You know? When you pray, and then in verse 6, he then gives the application. When you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The Lord's prayer. So therefore, is God, is Jesus speaking to us today literally? 
avoid synagogues and street corners and go and, and when you pray, excuse me, I need to go into a little room. No, he's not talking about, he's not talking about physical application. He's talking about attitude. And the attitude is, don't be like the person that prays very beautifully on the side of the street because actually he doesn't want God's will to be done. He just wants his voice to be heard. Attitude. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, when you, and then in verse 7, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans for they think and what we heard because there are many words. Don't be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So there's an attitude check as well. You know, Don't pray very long and vibrant prayers thinking that you will impress God. No, God already knows what. So simple conversation will be sufficient. Then, verse 9 comes in. This then is how you should pray. This then is the, this then how you should, this is then the attitude of how then you should pray. Our Father in heaven, pray, so therefore pray in the attitude of knowing God's sovereignty, that God's name is holy, that God's kingdom will come and will be on earth as in heaven, that God is, that God is merciful. He will give us our daily bread and He'll even forgive us of our sins. You know? And then, we, and then we also see that God is our salvation. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one. And then, with that attitude, and then with that attitude check in mind, Jesus then gives, us this, he then gives us this final outcome. If you forgive other people, see, it's an attitude. If you, mm -hmm. if you have the attitude of forgiving others when they sin or do harm or, or against you, then God will see the attitude of your heart and reflect the attitude and he does therefore forgive you. If you do not forgive their sins and then your father will not forgive your sins. So the attitude of how we approach prayer, what Jesus is pointing out, is actually based on, on, a, on the attitude of ourselves. Do we think ourselves as gods that anyone who goes against you therefore must have revenge? Or do you think of yourself as, a, as an instrument of God so that when God, so that when other people harm you, you will actually, no, I'll forgive you. Because why? God has really done that for me. Mm -hmm. So, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 13, therefore, I stress it again, it's not a formula which then equals to some sort of uh, uh, magic words that brings, out, that brings a particular fruition of your prayers. It's not even a formulation, but it's a reminder of our attitude on how, how should we approach God, in, uh, approach God with our prayers and in accordance to His will. Mm. Right. So it's not. It's not so much of an incantation, lah. No. Because no, no. I think also in, in uh, I don't think it's just in the, the eastern uh, uh the eastern side of the world that that has a tendency to do that. I think like a lot of uh, uh western horror films, you know, they tend to take a lot of this uh, prayers mm. and uh and uh, uh 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 rituals as sort of like. Uh, incantations or formulations, as you say, exactly. to, to ward yeah. off some kind of evil. It, 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 I think, like I think, even in the modern uh, Western films, it, it has a lot of this Eastern elements in it already, where there's this sort of like talisman, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the form of a cross and, and yep. all this kind yep. of stuff. The, the yeah. exorcism, the, all the exorcism movies, lah. You know, you know, the yeah. moment people start praying, "Oh, Father, we shall have," and then suddenly the woman that's tied to the bed, they go. Grrr! It goes like she goes absolutely nuts, you know. She goes like, yeah. yeah, no, it's it, it's it's not that it's not that. All. Although, uh, uh, speaking as a pastor, speaking as a pastor, we've done deliverances before. Um, it is not it, it is not in that particular prayer that the that the demons react, but it's actually in the it's actually because of the weight of God's word. So I can actually be reading Genesis chapter one verse one, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, in uh, uh, in front of a person who might be possessed or oppressed. You know, and he will, he or she will have the same reaction. Mm, okay. So that's so so that's just an interesting side uh, segue into looking yeah. at, looking at exorcism. So it, so one must understand it is not it is not the formulation of the words. <clears throat> so uh, why? Because if it's the formulation of the words, I shouldn't. Well, then the question will then be, of course, which Bible version should I be using when I go in to cast out demons? You know, <laughs> King James. No. <laughs> You know, maybe the Hebrew or the Greek. No, it's not. Right. It's more like the weight of God's sovereignty that is displayed in His Word and in His people and through His Spirit towards towards those that towards those who rebel against Him. Mm, right. Great point. Great point. Uh, so yeah, we're just coming towards the end of uh, this uh, session, and uh, uh, just uh, uh, a, a last a last question to ask. Uh, uh, I think. Um, I think all Christians can relate to this. 
uh, is that there are days that sometimes we struggle to pray, uh, and oftentimes in this sort of um, in this materialistic, sensual world, um, the uh, many Christians would pray uh, would not pray because they don't feel like praying or they don't have that sort of. Uh, as the the young people would commonly say, we don't have inspiration, we don't have motivation, um, and so sometimes we we ourselves do know that uh, uh, there can be challenges in our prayer life. Uh, so uh, as a pastor and as someone who studies the Bible, um, what are some uh, encouragement or advice would you give to Christians uh, to to continue praying or who? who are struggling to pray. Okay. Well, what is prayer? It is a communication between man, between man and God. And both of us, who, and all of us who have had interactions with our parents before, and interactions with our, our, with our, with our even among ourselves, sometimes it is not, sometimes prayers need not be said of anything. Yeah, prayers need not be said in order for prayer to occur. So I give you an example. You know, um, I know some, I have a couple of friends and what they just love to do is they'll go to a cafe. They'll, they'll, they will have some niceties among each, uh, between each other, but their agenda is to just sit down and read. Mm. So they just sit and read. And even though, and even though they are not communicating explicitly, their fellowship with each other is is very much felt and appreciated. So therefore, as a this is a pastoral perspective, for those of you who do not have who has issues in figuring out what to pray and how to pray, you don't need to do you don't you, you don't uh, and you don't know what to say. I can give you the confidence that there's nothing that needs to be said. For God know for God knows the the, the emotions of your heart. God knows the place that you are. They, they, God knows the things in which you are keeping in secret, and He hears those prayers. That's His promise. You see, God does not hear prayers that just comes out of the mouth. God hears the prayers that comes out of our hearts. It is because that God hears the desires of our hearts that we are both number one condemned because of our sin, but number two we are then made we, we, are, we are then made righteous through Jesus Christ, and in our righteousness with Jesus Christ, He then He, he then hears us. Not, not as if we are just a, a loyal subject to his kingdom, but as his child. Because when he sees us, he sees his son Jesus. Mm. That's one thing. Second thing is that, suppose you do need help in formulating words in prayer. Um, as a pastor, I will look to scripture. And the book of Psalms is a good, is a good start. You know? So Psalms is nothing but prayers, nothing but praises. You know? And mm. thanks be to God for King David that not only did he write prayers when he was happy, he also wrote prayers when he was depressed, sorrowful, angry, anxious, anxious and grieving. So pick one, go ahead. And if you don't know how to pick one, then my suggestion would therefore be Google. You know, uh, I found lots and lots of, of resources and when there are some chapters in my life and when there are some... Uh, difficult ceremonies or difficult um, interactions that I have to do and I do not know what to say by myself, I'll go online and I'll find the adequate prayer that is based on scripture that will, uh, that, they can, that they can help me uh, do, that they can help me minister to the person that I'm intending to minister. So yeah, go online, find it. Uh, in my library, in my office, I have books upon books on on Bible, uh, uh, not, not just Bible verses, but on uh, prayers by people who have crafted it and they give good suggestions that, you know, here's what you can pray in the birth of a newborn. There's a, birth you can, there's a prayer that you can pray over, over the death of an infant. Mm -hmm. you know, this is a prayer that you can pray over, the, uh, over a person, over a person who, who, who had died all of a sudden, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, this is where I feel the Anglican Book of Common Prayer actually comes in very handy, because not when they wrote those prayers, they didn't write it just to to just say something nice and bye bye, but actually it, he, they wrote it to help us understand who God is as well. So mm -hmm. that would be a second advice. Third advice: If you are charismatic, I envy you. 
Because what that means is, when you don't know what to pray, you just pray. <laughs> let the angels speak for you. You know, let the let the angels speak for you. Let God's spirit inspire inspire your heart to speak in to speak in a, to speak in a word that that I, that no one understands, and even you yourself don't understand because why you you don't even understand your own emotion. So let God so so let God deal with that until finally he until finally you can come to a place in your life where you can actually describe what you're feeling or what you are going or what you are going through, and then and then the real conversation and therefore the real communion and healing actually begins in our hearts. Yeah. So those are those are three advices I'll give. Number one is look to scriptures because they will help you pray. Number two is look online and see yeah yeah look, look online and see. Um, and see, uh, 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 yeah, look online and see what what prayers would best describe what you're going through. And if you can't find it either, you can either say a whole bunch of you can you can either say a whole bunch of something inspired by the spirit, or you can just say nothing. Sit mm -hmm. quietly. You can sit, sit quietly. Let your let your emotions let your emotions flow out, uh, and let God and let and let God be your remedy. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I think uh, that's uh, all we have for today. Uh, once again, uh, we want to thank uh, Pastor Mark, who is our co-founder of uh, Explain Apologetics, for uh, helping us to uh, further understand uh, the idea of prayer or the topic of prayer, uh, particularly within uh, the Christian context and particularly from what the Bible says. And we hope this session has helped you uh, especially when, when you're reading through the verses that we, we brought up, um, these difficult verses that sometimes, or not sometimes, many times uh, are taken out of context. Um, uh, before we end, uh, Pasama, do you have any final thoughts for anyone, for everyone? Um, I, want to, I want to speak especially for those in, the particular time, in this particular time when we are going through an epidemic. You know, and those who are uh, struggling with the idea that because because this epidemic, if we are not infected, we are definitely affected. You know, so for those who have been infected, know this: we, our prayers have always been and will continue to be in inter uh, 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 in intervention with God, an intervention with God, so that we may so that we may see uh, healing, recovery. But of course, ultimately, for the eternal destiny. You know, I pray that you will consider Jesus, and even even in these times, for those who are infected, and even for those who are affected, for those who are affected by the uh, by the aftermath of of the virus, it could be grief of a lost one. Some of you could be could have lost your jobs. Some of you may may feel that your business may not be in a will not be in a it's not in a good spot. I just want to I just want to encourage you that we as a Christian community. We hope to be able to help as much as we can. Go to a go to a nearby church, communicate to a nearby church, and say, "You know, I need help." You know, we will share with you Jesus and how He can help. But we also believe, but we also believe in in this time, uh, a more uh, physical, a more, a more appropriate assistance will be needed. So we've been giving food kind, uh, uh, giving uh, helps and contributions in kinds and food for those who need it, and even for those who. May, may need uh, help to keep afloat. We have been able to help as well. So yeah, uh, just want to just want to encourage you in that 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 God does answer prayers both through His divine intervention and as well as through our through the participation of the Church of Jesus Christ on this earth. Amen. All right, that's it for uh, our session today. We want to thank you all for uh, joining us on this session, and we hope that you've benefited much from it. Uh, if you have yet to subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, you may do so and uh, to in order to get more notifications in the future. Uh, until then, we'll see you again. On behalf of Pastor Mark and myself and of Explain Apologetics, thank you and goodbye.